Okay, so good morning. Uh, we will continue our discussion related to the phase change heat transfer in micro channels. Uh, so, yesterday we saw some of the important uh, flow regimes encountered in the case of macro channels. Uh, so, one very important difference between the micro and macro channel regimes is the influence of gravity on macro channels. So, therefore, depending on the orientation of uh, these tubes, whether they are horizontal or vertical, you may encounter different flow regimes. Whereas, in the uh, micro channels, uh, more or less once the diameter falls uh, of the order of few hundred of microns and below, so you do not have a strong influence of gravity anymore because of uh, the value of bond number being less than say 2 or 2.5. So, in this case uh, you will encounter as I said mostly um, uh, elongated bubbles, right. So, you have a single bubble uh, which is uh, nucleating and it can grow, but uh, unlike in the macro tubes, so these uh, bubbles will quickly reach the size of the diameter of the tube and then they cannot grow further in the cross sectional area. So, they will only expand along the length of this tube. So, mostly you will be dealing with the elongated bubbly flow or call it is also called the slug flow. So, people also refer to this as the Taylor bubble flow because you have a, a bubble uh, classical not like a classical spherical bubble, but an elongated bubble and you have uh, from the top and bottom although this looks like it is touching the tube, you have a very thin film of liquid which is uh, protecting the bubble directly from the impact of heat transfer from the tube. Okay. So, therefore, the predominant regimes will be based on the slug flow. So, you have a slug flow and as your uh, uh, volume fraction of vapor in increases, uh, you convert slowly from a slug flow regime to a slug annular. So, most of the vapor will be completely filling the core of the tube and the liquid uh, will be covering the core as an annulus. So, this will be the slug annular regime, right. And uh, so, you can also have a wavy annular pattern and finally, if your volume fraction increases, then you will still see the kind of a mist flow pattern where you have bulk of the tube is uh, cross sectional area is covered with vapor with a small uh, liquid uh, particles entrapped and as the vapor volume fraction further increases, you have only pure uh, uh, vapor at the end of the tube. Okay. So, therefore, um, I think these are all descriptive, but uh, I think you can probably understand that uh, you know the bubbly flow regime in micro channels are quite different, because in the macro channel case you have a cluster of these bubbles uh, at a given cross sectional area, uh, whereas in the micro tubes uh, you usually have not more than one at a time and this one will stretch and elongate into the slug or the Taylor bubble flow. So, this is how for example, the slug flow can look. There are different uh, regimes you know even in the slug flow. So, you do not have all the time a well defined elongated bubble like this. Okay. So, sometimes uh, you also have a kind of hysteresis in the advancing and the receding meniscus of these Taylor bubbles. So, that means the shape of the uh, meniscus might look different for the advancing side, which is moving um, uh, probably in the um, direction opposite to the direction of motion of the liquid to the receding one. Okay. So, therefore, if you take uh, okay. so if you take this bubble for for example, So, oh, each one is has. So, if you take this bubble, so the classical uh, way of drawing the Taylor bubble is something like this with hemispherical end caps, right. 
So, however, in this case you see that the suppose this is your direction of flow. Okay. So, the we call this as advancing or receding with respect to the movement of the liquid. So, in this case the liquid is this and this is your vapor. Okay. So, the liquid is actually moving should move in this direction for this to be advancing. So, therefore, this is your advancing meniscus okay, and this is your receding. You understand? So, this is your liquid and this is your vapor. The direction in which uh, the liquid moves, if you if you see this, the liquid moves in this direction as the flow. So, this is your advancing meniscus. So, if you look at this meniscus, okay, so this is your vapor. So, the vapor moves in this direction. Okay, so, that is your receding meniscus. So, the advancing and receding generally is defined with direction to how the liquid moves, the direction of the motion of uh, the liquid. Okay, if the liquid moves from left to right, so that is your advancing meniscus. If the vapor moves from left to right, that is your receding meniscus. Okay. So, therefore, the advancing and receding meniscus have different shapes of the end caps. Right? So, these are some kind of phenomena that can happen because the temperature at this point of the wall is not the same as this point. So, usually since you are applying a uniform heat flux, the temperature of the wall will continue increasing along the length of the tube. So, the temperature at this position will be usually higher than this. So, that will have a higher sometimes can have a higher um, evaporation rate compared to the portion here. Okay. So, therefore, all this will cause uh, hysteresis in the shape of meniscus in the advancing and receding section. So, the slug flow does not always have to look like a classical slug flow here that is shown in this particular figure elongated bubbly flow. So, there are also other ways of classifying, but uh, I am not very keen in explaining all this to you because in micro channels we are rarely encounter uh, things like wispy annular flow, but annular flow is quite common. So, here you can see that you have a vapor core. So, this, this is your vapor core here and surrounded by liquid film. So, the liquid film is confined to the annular portion outside and the vapor core is now fully surrounded. So, earlier you had bubbles like this, vapor bubbles separated by liquid portions. So, you have liquid slux vapor plux. Okay. So, now as the mass fraction of the vapor increases, so these plugs increasingly become longer and longer this vapor plugs and then they coalesce and then they continuously form a straight core. Okay. As the volume fraction of the vapor increases, the entire core is filled with vapor and the liquid is confined to the periphery. So, this is, this is called the annular flow. So, this happens at a heat flux which is progressively higher than the slug flow regime. So, if you are going for example, in this direction, so you first encounter the bubbly flow, then the slug flow, then you have the annular flow. Okay. So, usually in micro channels, the most common regime, if you are really operating in the micro channel, is the slug flow and very high heat fluxes, you can also encounter the annular flow regime and you do not want to really dry out. right? So, dry out is very bad in terms of heat transfer. So, it, so you do not want 
actually these two regimes, one is pure liquid, pure vapor that defeats the purpose of two phase flow. So, you want to hold as much as possible to the bubbly regime. That is why most of the, uh, the flow regime in micro channels are confined towards the slug flow. Annular flow can be encountered if you have very high heat fluxes, but beyond that you do not want to result in a dry out and therefore, loss of heat transfer coefficient. So, this gives you what are called as flow maps. Okay. So, as you can see the as the name suggests, so this these are like mapping the different flow regimes in a two dimensional uh, diagram, which plots the mass flow rate of the liquid versus mass flow rate of the vapor. Okay. So, on the x axis we plot generally the mass flow rate of vapor. So, mass flow rate or sometimes it is just the velocity. Okay. On the y axis you plot the velocity of liquid. So, this is one way of plotting the flow map because at any section if you have more vapor than liquid, so there will be a slip between the liquid and the vapor. So, both of them will not have the same velocity. So, therefore, you have you tend to have either higher liquid velocity compared to gas or if you have more gas you tend to have higher gas velocity than liquid. The same is true if you have adiabatic two phase flows. So, when you mix two different phases air or water. Okay. So, you tend to mix a certain flow rate of air, certain flow rate of tube uh, water in the tube and this will produce the different flow regimes. Okay. In either case you will be measuring what is the velocity of one component with respect to the other and depending on the relative magnitude of one of the one over the other all these flow regimes can be drawn on a two dimensional uh, diagram and marked as flow maps. So, for example, if you have a value of velocity of vapor which is very low and also the value of liquid velocity also very low. So, so that uh, you have same order of magnitude. So, you are somewhere here. right? So, you are somewhere in this particular regime. So, this marks one transition from one flow regime to the other. Okay. So, that means if you have very less liquid flow rate and moderate gas flow rate. So, the kind of pattern that you will get will be what slug. Okay. And if you increase the gas flow rate further, then you end up for the same similar liquid flow rate. If you continue increasing your gas flow rate, you end up getting into the annular regime. So, therefore, you have therefore, the slug annular here okay, or you have the wavy annular again depending on the order of magnitude of the liquid velocity. Okay. So, you, so, this is for a typical diameter of 3.4 mm. So, you can call this almost like a macro channel. So, as you have very high values of liquid velocity compared to gas velocity, you are still in the bubbly flow regime. Okay. So, all these are very interesting to plot it on a two dimensional figure, because from this you know the transition from one regime to the other. So, these give you the transition lines or change of regime lines. So, you know exactly if you want to get a particular flow regime what kind of velocities of liquid and gas that you have to operate. Right? 
So, once you do an experiment and obtain a map like this, so anybody who wants to replicate it will go to the map, they will know for get identifying this particular regime, I have to operate with this values of liquid and gas velocity. Okay. This is definitely for a particular working fluid, again for a different working fluid, it will be different and again for a different heat flux, this will be different. So, usually when you plot the flow pattern map, okay, if you plot it in a dimensional form, you have to specify which working fluid is this and which heat flux, which diameter of the tube. If this is an adiabatic case, then you do not worry about the heat flux. So, you just uh, only specify which diameter and which working fluid combination, air, water or some other liquid air. Okay. Now, what is clear is that as you go, so on the left we have the data points and also the transition lines on the right figure we have only the transition lines. So, there you have all the uh, patterns marked and these are coming from different experiments. So, there is no perfect agreement between two sets of experimental data, right. So, that is very important to note. Okay. So, sometimes depending on the order of accuracy of the way they measure the velocities and identify the because this is purely visual identification. So, the transition from one flow pattern to the other sometimes may not be so easy to identify visually. Okay. So, therefore, that is why the transition lines tend to slightly deviate between different experimental groups. So, as you reduce the size of the tube, now what do you find? So, for example, now let us go to the next case. These are the real small tubes. Now, we have 1.7, 1.2, now 0.6, we have 600 micron tube. Now, what do you see from 1.7, 1.2 and this case? Huh? Yeah, and you, you see the slug regime is getting increasingly centered and more dominant for a wide range of gas velocities. So, here for a limited range of gas velocities, you have the slug pattern, whereas if you go to the micro channel for a wide range of gas velocities, you still have the slug pattern and finally, your pattern is mostly predominantly slug or slug animal, right. So, these are your major area under the flow pattern maps. So, it becomes very straightforward, you know, you operate with whatever gas velocities. So, now it only depends on the liquid velocity. So, if your liquid velocity is somewhat moderately high, then you are in the slug regime. If the liquid velocity drops, then you are in the annular regime. So, only these two regimes, so you have a more, more or less like a binary map, binary flow regime. So, you either you are in the slug or slug annual. So, or if it is very, very high value, then you are in the bubbly pattern. Okay. So, this is how it tends to shift. So, you have predominance. So, in the other case, you might have uh, depending on the value of gas velocity, slug, slug annular, annular, but as you go towards micro channel, irrespective of whatever gas velocity, okay, if you control the, your liquid velocity, you always can maintain a slug flow. So, that, uh, that means your slug flow is the most predominant flow pattern in a micro channel. Okay. So, that is why usually most of the uh, uh, phase change phenomena in micro channels always deal with slug flow, slug flow or Taylor bubble. Okay, so, um, I think with this you have kind of an understanding about how to look at the flow regimes and map it to a two phase flow map and therefore, identify the different regimes. So, I will now quickly go a, a little bit into the um, estimation of pressure drop 
So which is a very important parameter in micro channels. So in micro channels you have a large pressure penalty, right? So because the diameter of the tube is very small, for the same value of friction factor, you have to apply a large pressure drop to drive the flow for the same Reynolds number, okay? So pressure drop estimation becomes very important. Now the more added complexity is you have two phases. So therefore, how do you theoretically build correlations to understand pressure drop? The next portion will be your heat transfer coefficient. Okay. So in general, again for a, a micro channel or mini channel, you have different contributions to the pressure drop, overall pressure drop, similar to that we have seen uh, in pure single phase liquid flow. You have contraction losses, you have expansion losses. Okay. So the first term here represents the contraction pressure loss. Okay. So your overall pressure drop has contraction pressure loss, your expansion pressure loss. Okay. There could be some influence of gravitational head, but this can be neglected most of the times. Sometimes locally evaporation leads to more production of vapor which can actually accelerate. So there could be a component which can also be important sometimes at very high heat fluxes or on regions where you have non-uniform temperatures. Okay. So locally suddenly the temperature, wall temperature going up, so suddenly the, uh, the amount of uh, the volume of uh, vapor can increase and this can accelerate. Apart from that, two important contributions. One is the single phase pressure loss due to friction. The other is the two phase pressure drop. Okay. So the single phase pressure loss is straightforward. That means if you fill your entire um, tube with say liquid, what would be the pressure drop? This is coming from your Darcy chart. Okay. But what you actually have is actually a two phase flow. So therefore, you have to somehow account also for the two phase pressure drop. So how do we account for that? So each component. So your delta P C that is pressure loss due to sudden contraction. So these are some standard correlations depending on the contraction ratio and so on. So you can substitute uh, the corresponding parameters. So this also has what we call as a two phase flow multiplier. So if you remember our Martinelli parameter, so this is your Mart Martinelli parameter which gives you the ratio of pressure drop if the tube was filled with entirely liquid to the pressure drop if the tube is filled with entirely vapor. So that is generally used in uh, pressure gradient correlation. So you have a correlation in which now psi is a function of x, x is the quality and so this becomes a kind of a two phase flow multiplier. So that means depending on the quality, even the contraction losses can be different. Okay? So if it is pure liquid, you, you have a different contraction loss. If it is pure vapor, you have a different contraction loss. So for a two phase mixture, so therefore even the contraction loss becomes a function of the quality of the mixture. So similarly, you, can, you have another correlation for calculating the exit pressure loss. So this is also a function of the mass fraction. Okay. So through psi s, this is a function of x. So the local friction pressure gradient, okay. so that means for a two phase flow, so we want to calculate the pressure loss. So that is this particular component, two phase pressure drop. So the two phase pressure drop usually is calculated as the pressure drop if you had fully filled it with liquid because this is the largest value that you will get multiplied by what is called as a two phase multiplier. Okay. So what is the maximum value of pressure drop you will get is if you fill it completely with pure liquid. Okay. So that is 
basically the value multiplied by a correction factor for two phase flow. So, this is called a two phase multiplier and this two phase multiplier is written as function of capital X. What is capital X? Martinelli parameter. So, you independently look at the pressure drop if it is completely filled with liquid, completely filled with gas take the ratio. So, now you therefore know what is your two phase multiplier and the, this will give you what is the two phase pressure, pressure drop. So, now this has some constants, so all these are empirical, okay. these are not very exact ways of finding delta p, the exact way is to only do an experiment and find it. So, if you want to do it theoretically, so these are coming from experimental data, so, so the constants are all empirical values. So, in the case of uh, the two phase multiplier, so this has a constant c. Okay. So, these, this constant c is attributed to uh, Cheesholm and sometimes called as Cheesholm parameter. Okay. So, you have different values of c depend, depending on whether you have a laminar or turbulent regime. So, if you are both the liquid and vapor phases are turbulent, it can be very high 21. If both phases are laminar, then this is the lowest value. Okay. And your x square is your Martinelli parameter, you should remember. Okay. So, x will be square root of the Martinelli parameter. So, there are also some correlations for getting out C for non circular tubes. Okay. So, for circular tubes, you just put in if both phases are laminar, you substitute C equal to 5, but for non circular tubes, you calculate the hydraulic diameter d h and then use this correlation given by Mishima and Hibiki to calculate C and that you substitute to calculate the two phase multiplier and therefore, the two phase pressure drop. Okay. So, uh, apart from this you have also contribution from what we call as acceleration pressure drop. So, acceleration pressure drop is depending on the dif difference between the densities of vapor and liquid and locally this can accelerate if you have large amounts of vapor suddenly produced. So, this is given by this particular equation. So, g is the volume flow rate and um, you have the difference between the specific volume of vapor and liquid phases that is nu L v and you have the quality of vapor at the exit. So, all these are some empirical correlations and similarly another correlation for the contribution of gravitational pressure drop. So, usually in as this di diameter of this uh, channel gets smaller and smaller, this gravitational pressure drop will become negligible. Okay. So, the contribution of usually the two phase pressure drop due to friction, this will be the biggest contribution. Okay. And you can also have significant en entry and exit losses, because in micro channels as I said entry and exit losses are significant because of very high contraction and expansion ratio. Okay. So, they also have to be accounted for. Okay. So, therefore, if you um, look at uh, the comparison of uh, if you calculate your overall pressure drop from these correlations and you compare it with experimental data, you see some deviations can be possible. Okay. So, for example, uh, the if you use the value of C from Mishima and Hibiki, you see there is a substantial deviation from the experimental data, whereas uh, the other model for C proposed by English and Kandlikar, so that shows a closer agreement. Okay. So, overall this is the thumb rule way of calculating the pressure drop. Okay. It is a take into account the contraction, expansion, acceleration, gravitation and two phase pressure drop. The two phase pressure drop is the one which depends on the Martinelli parameter. Okay. So, you define what is called a two phase multiplier which is a function of the Martinelli parameter. So, you estimate the, the Cheesholm 
parameter or factor c okay depending on whether the flow is turbulent or laminar and you have to check for either flow okay the vapor could be turbulent while the liquid could be laminar more often the case the vapor velocity is higher than the liquid okay so now if you go into the heat transfer so what are the correlations available how do you calculate heat transfer rate for two phase flows so a lot of uh, experiments have been done there are there are no analytical methods to calculate h like the way for single phase so we don't have a fully developed correlation like in the single phase so we generally have uh, two regimes so one either for a laminar flow or for a turbulent flow okay so now um, the most important correlation which has been proposed by kandlikar and stein k 2003 and kandlikar and balasubramanian 2004 so for the laminar flow regime they have produced a very com uh, comprehensive correlation okay so that is you have to check if your reynolds numbers greater than 100 so in this case how do you uh, get the value of two phase heat transfer htp is two phase heat transfer so this has contributions from two components okay so two empirical correlations so one is the nbd the other is cbd okay so depending on whichever is larger you calculate you put the corresponding value of convection number co is nothing but convection number and hlo is nothing but the single phase heat transfer coefficient that means you fill the entire tube with liquid so that is why it is h subscript l okay so fully with liquid and calculate the single phase heat transfer coefficient and you substitute into this so your bo is nothing but boiling number so there is some small confusion they have used bo for both boiling and bond number so here it refers to boiling number co is the convection number okay so hlo is your single phase heat transfer coefficient if it is fully filled with liquid and x is your quality of vapor or mass fraction there is a parameter called ff1 so this is a, again another empirical parameter and depending on different working fluids this parameter will be different okay so all these have been recommended by kandlikar so this is what is generally used if your reynolds number so how do you calculate your reynolds number your reynolds number should be calculated based on only the liquid properties okay so that is why we have r subscript l so l o means he says liquid only okay so if you replace this two phase mixture with fully liquid that is a value of r e l and h l so what happens to other values of reynolds number so if your reynolds number is uh, yeah so for the single phase you know the uh, correlations right so for calculating hlo again you can refer to correlations uh, which could be by nielinski or petukov these are the standard correlations the nielinski and petukov are also valid for um, turbulent regimes for laminar regime that is for reynolds number up to say 1600 you use your laminar nusselt number whether it is a constant heat flux or constant temperature constant temperature is 3.66 constant heat flux is 4.36 now once the flow regime goes to turbulent then you can use either the nielinski or petukov so depending on whether it is very highly turbulent or moderately turbulent okay so from from these correlations you get the single phase heat transfer coefficient then you go and plug it 
into this expression find the greater of the two. So, that gives you the two phase heat transfer coefficient. So, this is again for Reynolds number based on the liquid property greater than 100. So, what happens for very small Reynolds numbers? So, there is another correlation. So, that is purely based on only HTP NBD. Okay. So, that is the same as this. So, that you do not have to calculate HTP CBD and find the larger of the two. So, you directly estimate your two phase heat transfer coefficient as equal to HTP NBD. So, this is a function of again convection number, boiling number and single phase heat transfer coefficient. So, so this is the most commonly used heat transfer correlation. So, uh, uh, I think uh, there is a nice review paper by Satish Kandlikar um, appearing in Journal of Heat Transfer in 2004. So, in that he has given a summary of these correlations. Okay. So, the important thing is first you check the Reynolds number based on pure liquid property and if it is less than 100, you directly calculate your two phase heat transfer coefficient as equal to HTP and BD based on this. If it is greater than 100, you check the larger value of HTP and BD or HTP CBD. So, now what is NBD and CBD? So, this is what I have not told you. So, one is the nucleate boiling, the other is convective boiling. So, your nucleate boiling is similar to the boiling phenomena that happens in pool boiling when you have bubbly flow, bubbly flow regime. So, okay, that is driven purely by the heat flux, whereas the convective boiling is driven by the mass flux. So, you have higher flow rates, okay, higher values of Reynolds number. So, in that the mixing Okay, which is a very important component is brought by the mass flux which also will impact the heat transfer and evaporation process. So, therefore, for high Reynolds number there is a contribution from both the nucleate boiling as well as the convective boiling whereas, for low Reynolds numbers you can ignore the convective boiling contribution. So, just to show you how this correlation works. So, depending on the vapor volume fraction you can, so you see this correlations are all functions of vapor volume fraction or mass fraction, excess mass fraction. So, depending on the mass fraction you get different values of HTP, <coughs> right. So, therefore, if you heat the tube continuously and put it in say a vertical mode and you want to calculate the heat transfer coefficient right from the bubbly regime all the way to the annular regime. So, you can use the same correlations and plot this as a function of x. So, as your x increases that means, you are transitioning from one flow regime to the other. So, this is what the plot says. So, you are going virtually from 1 0 to 1. So, 1 you will never be able to achieve completely and you do not want, but the data points are all plotted between 0 and 1. That means, you have heated the tube and locally you want to see how the heat transfer coefficient varies. So, what this shows is the maximum value of two phase heat transfer coefficient is somewhere at around 0.2. Okay, so, this is where the slug flow regime is. So, as you increasingly go towards higher mass fractions towards the annular flow and then finally, dry out the heat transfer coefficient drops. Okay. So, and you see that uh, there is a comparison of experiments versus the HTP evaluated from these correlations. So, both seem to be very close. So, they have compared for one smaller value of heat flux, the other which are which is quite high and although some deviation is observed for the smaller value of heat flux, overall you know the correlations developed uh, empirically 
seem to be having a good agreement. Okay. So, therefore, um, the most important part of the, uh, the two phase flow is to understand how to calculate pressure drop and heat transfer coefficient. Right? And de depending on the flow regime, you should be able to identify what is your mass fraction. You should be able to understand for a given Reynolds number. So, how to extract your heat transfer coefficient from these correlations. Okay, so, I think uh, I was uh, talking about therefore, these two regimes. So, now that you understand that in the heat transfer co coefficient correlation, you have a contribution from the nucleate boiling and also the convective boiling. Okay. So, wh what is the difference? So, this initial nucleation and evaporation is happening due to the presence of cavitational sites and this depends on the temperature gradient. So, if your local temperature exceeds the saturation temperature, then you have the bubble coming and this starts to grow and the bulk of the liquid also starts to boil. So, this is a nucleate boiling phenomenon. The convective boiling is on top of this if you induce some bulk motion, it is like stirring. Okay. So, you are going to augment the evaporation rates. So, therefore, overall effect of flow boiling will therefore, be an effect of stirring in addition to the localized evaporation due to temperature gradient. So, that is why the heat transfer coefficient is higher in, in the flow boiling regime due to the contribution of convective boiling to towards the nucleate boil. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, I, so, these are some kind of uh, um, data people have generated as you change the heat flux. So, what happens to the um, heat transfer coefficient and so on. I think this uh, you can go through, I uh, will upload the uh, PPT. So, so, one is probably looking at the um, critical heat flux. Okay, and departure from nucleate boiling. So, I think these are uh, mostly coming from the experiments. Okay, there, is, there is no rigorous theory or um, analytical models for these, um, but I will upload this. Uh, you should, if you need to refer to any other topic, you can go to the textbook and also take the reference from there. Okay. So, with this we will um, kind of conclude the phase change heat transfer in micro channels. So, if you have any questions or anything we can probably discuss for 4 or 5 minutes. So, how, how many of you are actually doing some work related to uh, micro channels or so what are you 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 are also so two of you so like what what kind of are you doing experiment or sir, both design and experiment micro nozzles okay the micro nozzles yeah so um, and this is with heat transfer uh, yeah we would have like not to have that uh, heat transfer because a single micro nozzle it's all right Okay. So, what we found out was that silicon was highly conductive mm -hmm. and the uh, heat generated by conversion in one of the nozzles was enough to ignite the uh, material in the next nozzle. So, this is uh, having an application micro thrusters? Yeah, micro satellites. Nano satellites. <coughs> so, uh, the, with whom are you working? Uh, here? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Okay, okay, okay. So, you are working uh, on what related to mi micro channel heat transfer? Yes, sir. Uh, pressure, on the pressure drop for a multiple bubbles in a micro channel. Okay. So, uh, in that case, what With you heat transfer or this is adiabatic? Only the later parts. Uh -huh. so 
with with heat transfer so you are doing an experiment uh, no, sir uh, 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 trying to uh, develop a model of okay, there is a already a model so trying to extend it for the multiple loops okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, because uh, in terms of experiments also, the general problem is uh, getting an agreement between uh, different experiments, okay. So, many times they are not repeatable because of the local condition of uh, the surface plays a very important role here. So, the, what you see here uh, is See, suppose you have a subcooled flow coming at the inlet, you know, it takes some time for this to heat up, reach saturation and then the nucleation starts. So, you see that these nucleation happens right at the surface, okay, and this is a completely su su surface texture related phenomena and you do not have control. You can have a control if you give precision nucleation sites, okay. If you take a general surface and you are studying, so person who is doing experiment here in another room will not get the same values because the nucleation sites will completely change the flow regimes. So, if the surface has been very smooth, the same heat flux you apply, you will not get any nucleation. The surface is very less for a lower heat flux, already you will have lot of bubbles. Okay, so, one very difficult part of experimentation is repeatability, but in spite of that I think, I mean as this figure shows, I think uh, they have put lot of effort especially the group from Professor Satish Kandlikar in uh, building useful practical correlations. I mean you, they have not been for example, tested for all different kinds of working fluids, all different kinds of surfaces. But in general, so this is for R134A, okay. So, they must have used uh, at least two or three working fluids in building this data, okay. So, if you use it for a completely different working fluid which is highly volatile, it may not yield good results. So, it is not a closed problem, okay. So, you should understand that these have been built in the only in the last 8 or 9 years work. Some more correlations are also coming out for different fluids, but increasingly <coughs> difficult to find make it very, very generic for all class of working fluids, okay. So, this is the biggest challenge with two phase flows. All right, so we stop here. I um, I'll upload this uh, later on. I hope you saw the assignment five that is uploaded. Uh, please work on it. The last date is uh, uh, on eighth of uh, November. Is that that is the last class? So, so, uh, so, uh, so we have four more classes after this. So. I will be covering uh, something related to nano fluids because that is also very popular these days. So, nano fluid um, and he related heat transfer and finally, something on the experimental methods at micro nano scale because that is also very important uh, if you if you want to do experiments you should understand that uh, you cannot just simply use a standard thermocouple to measure the temperature of these things. Okay. So, then what is the right kind of thermocouple that you use? What, what should be the sensitivity of this? So, all this need to be also understood, it is not only just the theory part, but uh, very important is the recent uh, advancements in the experimentation to measure things at micro nano scale.